Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. Today's invited speaker is Professor Frederick Ponton, who is currently a professor at Uppsala University in Sweden. Dr. Ponton will talk to us about the Human Protein Atlas or HPA, which is a Swedish based program. It started in 2003 with the aim to map all the human proteins in cells, tissues and organs using integration of various omic technologies like antibody based imaging, mass spectrometry based proteomics, transcriptomics and systems biology. He will tell us about this mega project, how it succeeded despite having multiple challenges. He will also tell us about how Indian pathologists and research collaborators have played a great role to make everything possible for success of this project. In today's lecture, he will mainly focus on the tissue atlas of human protein atlas. Further, he will tell us about how RNA and protein expression throughout different tissue follows a trend and how this correlation need to be considered for research if we want to obtain the bigger picture. Dr. Ponter will also talk to us about the subproteome, organ based proteome, secretome present in HPA which will provide you an idea how to use this useful resource for your own research. So, let us welcome Professor Frederick Ponton. Uh, what I'll talk about today is, is the Human Protein Atlas and I'll give you first just a, a brief uh, background about the project. I'll give you a little bit of our results and data and where we are right now and in the end I'll give you some perspectives of where we're heading the next couple of years. <clears throat> so this project started 15 years ago. We received a very generous funding from private non-profit uh, uh, research foundation, the Wallenberg Foundation. And that has kept us uh, alive for these 15 years. And we had the goal then to have a first draft of a human protein atlas in 2015, and we fulfilled that goal, and I'll come back to that. The project is a joint effort from the Royal Institute of Technology and Uppsala University, and is uh, head of the whole project is, and director is uh, Professor Matthias Elian, who's a, a very old friend of mine, and I'm heading the Uppsala uh, efforts uh, uh, of the project. So uh, our vision then, and this is timely, this was, you, if you think back, this was started to be planned on during 2002. And if you remember 2001, the, the Human Genetic Code was, was published in Science and Nature by, by uh, the uh, UPO, not UPO, UGO initiative and by Craig Venter. And of course, having all the, the blueprint, having all the ACTs and Gs, uh, a very logical next step would be to try to add an information layer of what do then all the proteins do that the, our genes encode for. So that was our, our kind of vision and, and the goals then came down to let's try to make uh, uh, affinity probes, antibodies, let's use these antibodies to characterize the human proteome and then at last uh, emerging after a couple of years was, well, if we have all the data and if we have the reagents, let's try to put this into some clinical perspective and, and try to make some use into, into discovery medicine and also trying to make some biomarkers and diagnostics, future treatments, etc. So we set up a, a multidisciplinary team, a kind of Ford factory-like research project where we had redefined the different modules. Each module had its own monthly goals and had deliveries to the next goal and so on. And, and what we did, we started with an upstream bioinformatics part where we then had the, the code for all the protein coding genes. We selected a code that, was, that we blasted against the, I won't go into any details by the way. I think you all know this and you've heard about this. Anyway, this is where we started to make our recombinant proteins. And, and the idea behind it all is that we blasted the different amino acids against all the rest of the proteome to get as unique sequences as possible, to get as unique uh, protein fragments as possible to get as unique antibodies as possible in the end. Outsourcing the, the, uh, the uh, antibody production and then we had the immune technology and we ran everything on protein arrays and the, all the antibodies that bound specifically to the right uh, protein fragment, they were then tested further in, in immunistic chemistry, immunofluorescence and western blots. And what was very nice about this whole project was that all the data that we produced 
was put out in the open space for the scientific community to use. And that was a requirement from the Wallenberg Foundation from the beginning. And that has felt very good that there were no restrictions, all data we produce out in the open space. So uh, what we do and what I'll focus on is then gene expression profiling. And, we, and for gene expression profiling, we use an immunofluorescence for looking at cells and, and, and organelles, immunistic chemistry for looking at cells, tissues, organs, that level, and then we do RNA sequencing to get quantitative data for, for our gene expression profiles. And I'll briefly just uh, give you the background for this. I'm sure Dr. Navani has told you all about this before, but uh, what we use then for protein profiling are then affinity purified antibodies, uh, against all the different unique proteins that the, our, our, our genome encodes for. And uh, what we do then, we look at how proteins are distributed in all our different organs and tissues. And the way we can do this to get a comprehensive look at that without wasting too much tissue and too much uh, uh, reagents is that we use tissue microarrays. And we have them focused on normal tissues, cancer tissues, and also cell lines. And for normal tissues, we have 46 different normal tissue types in triplicates from three different individuals. We then make tissue microarrays by uh, selecting representative pieces of tissues. You t look under the, in the microscope, you find represent uh, representative areas, drill out a core, and then put it in a, a recipient block to, to produce tissue microarrays. And one of these can, we can make about 300, 350 sequential sections, thus use it for about 300, 350 different antibodies, and, and be able then to protein profile a large a part of the human body uh, by using tissue microarrays. And this was also very timely, because it was at the end of the 90s when, when um, uh, Oli Pekka Kalyuniemi coined the term tissue microarrays, and the first instruments were, were made for this. And this was also something that made this whole project possible, was that we had the possibility to use tissue microarrays. And I think this slide tells you everything about tissue microarrays. But handling 700 of these blocks for each antibody, that just would, would have been impossible, while handling four blocks here is absolutely possible. Immunistic chemistry is our basic method for when it comes to tissues, when it comes to, to getting uh, protein expression uh, profiles. Uh, and as you know, immunistic chemistry is a great method when it comes to spatial data, but it's, it's a poor method. Uh, it's not a method to get any quantitative data, but there's nothing like immunistic chemistry that can actually give you what structures, what subtypes of cells do express a certain protein. And it gives you a little bit feeling of quantity in the sense that if you have a complex tissue, you have one population here that's strongly positive, another one that's weakly positive, at least you know that this population expresses a higher level of the protein than, than the other one. But it doesn't give you any quantification at all, besides from that. Uh, and of course, to do this project, we had also to transform the, the glass slides into digital images. And that was also at the time then, when we started in 2003, uh, a challenge, absolutely, to handle all the enormous amounts of, of image data and to store the data and to be able to pick up the data and so on. And, and of course, the magic of the whole project at this time was not just putting out images in a big library, but also making some data from those images. And that's where our collaboration with India and with Dr. Navani started. Uh, we realized that you know, the, the scientific community would not have been helped by, by just having images stained with immunistic chemistry. And the people who can interpret immunistic chemistry and evaluate tissues, is this a cancer cell or is this a normal cell? Is it strongly expressed here or weakly? Those are the pathologists. And, and meeting up with Dr. Navani and his team of pathologists back in, in, in 2006, and we started then, set the first, uh, first site was set up at the Indian Cancer Society in 2007 by the, all these talented pathologists who started looking at images, and we had to solve all the internet IT uh, structure um, challenges and so on. But everything worked out very well. So uh, we continued to collaborate, and we were down here Many from my team were here for months and worked together with, with our Indian colleagues and, and we changed the site to another venue and, and we've had just great collaborations with, with, with uh, India 
uh, Indian pathologist in this project, uh, and they have produced all the data, which I'll show you on the next slide. And, and I've summarized that as being 10 certified pathologists sitting, looking at these images, evaluating them, putting out annotations. Is it weakly expressed? Is it strongly expressed? Is it in 25% of the cell population or more? And you can see here, uh, this is not the, the full figure, but it goes to beginning of 2012. You can see that they then go through 2 million images per year, which I think is extremely uh, impressive. And altogether, over 12 million images have been annotated by Indian pathologists. But not only the workflow and the volume is impressive, it's also been an impressive time to, for the research collaborations. And I just did this this morning, uh, checked out our, uh, me and, and, and Dr. Navani's, uh, uh, where we're co-authors on those papers. And they're highly cited papers in science and, and many good journals. So it's, it's not only been production of data, but it's also been a very fruitful scientific collaboration, which I'm, I'm very uh, grateful for. So that's the protein part of the tissue atlas and also of the, of the pathology atlas. And I'll come back to the pathology atlas in a while. Uh, what we realized a couple of years ago was that spatial data is great, but, it, but you need quantification. And, and I, I know that all of you know this since you work with proteomics, which is a quantitative method to a, a large extent. So what we did was we went back to the Uppsala Biobank and looked for frozen tissue samples and, and we, we went through these by microscope to see that we had normal tissue. We selected cases that were representative and where we had high quality RNA and we extracted RNA and then we did RNA sequencing to get then transcriptomics data from normal tissues. And we had at least three uh, different individuals for each tissue types and in the end we had or now we have 37 normal tissue types and over 200 individuals where we have all the transcriptomics data that has then empowered the Human Protein Atlas database. <clears throat> so this, now we started to learn a little bit more about the proteome and uh, about the human proteome and how are our genes actually expressed on the protein level. Because, and, and I won't come back to this more specifically, but it has been shown, and this has been a debate, and, and it depends a little bit on definitions, but how, what about the correlation between RNA and protein? And, and I say that for almost all genes, there's an extremely high correlation between RNA and protein. And when I say that, I mean across tissues or cell lines, if you have a high level of RNA in one cell line or one tissue type and a low level of RNA in another cell line or tissue type, the protein levels will follow the RNA levels. However, for each gene, there's a different RTP, RNA to protein ratio, and that can differ by many magnitudes. But if you go across tissues, the correlation is very high between RNA and protein. And that means that you can use RNA quantitative, RNA sequencing data as a proxy for protein levels. So what we learned here was that about half of our, our protein coding genes encode for proteins which are housekeeping proteins, 44% are expressed in all tissues. They, the, the proteins that you know, build structure and cell division, all, all cell integrity and everything. Then there's a mixed bag. And then, then we have these proteins, which are the most interesting proteins, the tissue type specific proteins. The proteins are only expressed in one tissue or in very few tissues or much higher expressed in a certain tissue type than compared to other types. These are the ones, of course, that, that are responsible for the special functions of different tissues, and these are the ones which will be interesting when it comes to diseases and, and disease biomarkers. And about 9% at the time, we couldn't find any, any RNA in our 37 different tissues, and these could of course be pseudogenes, they could be genes that are permanently turned off after development, or they could be genes that are in tissues that we didn't have, like inner ear or olfactory plate or other more remote types of tissues. Uh, with this uh, uh, data at hand, we started then to define the different human subproteomes, the different organ proteomes, uh, and we put this out on the protein atlas. And this is a part of the protein atlas where we've built the knowledge-based chapters. Uh, and I'll show you just one example after this. What was nice now was that we had the quantitative data from RNA sequencing, and we could combine it then with our spatial data from our antibodies, so we could look at where are the 
uh, adipose tissue specific uh, proteins, how are they expressed? What about the adrenal gland? Are they expressed in the adrenal medulla or are they in the cortex? Are they special subtypes of cells, etc.? And of course, the spatial information together with this uh, um, quantitative information doesn't give you function per se, but it gives you a very good hint of function when you see a protein expressed in a certain cell type in a, in a, in a certain organ. And these are just examples of such cell type or, or tissue type specific proteins expressed in either here exocrine pancreas or endocrine pancreas, etc. So we spent a couple of years writing papers. So if any of you are interested in any specific type of tissue or tissue proteome, uh, we have probably published a paper about it because we thought it was very interesting to go a little bit more into depth what, is it, what, is, what makes up the brain or what makes up the pancreas or whatever. Uh, another way of also transecting through the, the proteome is, is to do it not by organ, but, but uh, expression mode. Or, and I talked about the tissue-specific proteome. Of course, there's a housekeeping proteome. What about those proteomes? Or the regulatory proteomes? What about all the transcription factors? Where are they expressed? Are there differences in different tissue types, cell types, etc.? Secretome and membrane proteome, extremely important for all the communication between cells and also as biomarkers, of course. Isoform proteome, the very complex isoform proteome, which kind of empowers the whole uh, biology with a lot of complexity. Cancer proteome, obvious, and druggable proteome, very interesting for, for the drug industry, of course. And all these pages, knowledge-based pages, they are then in place at, in, the, in the protein atlas, so you can go there, and I'll show you one example from a, a organ proteome in just a second. So 2015, we said that, okay, now we have a first draft of the human proteome, and we were very successful to publish a paper in science, which has been very highly cited. We had a poster in science, uh, and we rebuilt the whole Protein Atlas uh, web uh, portal to, to then integrate the transcriptomics data and the proteomics data. So today, the Human Protein Atlas has three pillars. It has the tissue uh, atlas, normal tissue atlas, which shows you in w which organs and cell types uh, our genes are expressed. It has the cell atlas, which shows you in what organelles are our proteins expressed in the cell? And then we have the pathology atlas, which I'll come back to, which shows you where, where the, how does gene expression correlate to survival for patients that have cancer. And I'll, I'll show you a very short, just uh, a, a couple of slides from each of, 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 from the web portal. And I'll start with the human, human tissue atlas. And, and here you can go into and, and look at these if you want to go through the organ proteomes or the other subproteomes, and then you can just click on any of these uh, tissue types. Say here I click on colon. That brings me to uh, a couple of pages w w that summarizes the gene expression profile in colon. And if, say, I'm interested in then these uh, colon-specific proteins, I can then click on that, and that brings me into the hit list of the uh, of, the, uh, of uh, the protein atlas, and here I get the 165 proteins which are specifically expressed in the, in the colon. I can choose one of these, I can click on that, oops, and then I can click on that, that, yes. And then I get to the summary page, and in this case this is a, a gene called SAP-B2, encoding for protein that is more or less specifically expressed in the colon, in the epithelial cells of the colon and rectum. It's also expressed in the brain. We give our, a little summary about the, the, every gene, all 20,000 genes, and then the expression levels on the RNA level, which is an uh, FPKM, and then on the protein level, which is then uh, uh, how they are, how the uh, Indian pathologists have evaluated the expression level, uh, the protein expression levels. And then one can look at the data in more detail, the protein data as the bar, bar diagrams, our RNA. Uh, sequence data, but we also have imported for all genes the, the data from the Broad Institute, the GTEx project, and also from Rieke and the Phantom 5 <coughs> project. So, and as you can see, there's a very good consistency from the different platforms and the different uh, specimens that have been used. And, and I think this gives a lot of validity to the expression data that we show on the Protein Atlas. And then, of course, one can go and look at the primary data, the protein data where we then have three individuals for each antibody, and for this SAPI2 we had very many antibodies, and then at the deepest level you can then 
go into the, the, the high resolution image and look for yourself, where is SAP-B2 protein expressed? Well, it's expressed in the nucleus of glandular cells in colon, etc. And just as a little parenthesis, since this was a very highly specific uh, colon protein, we thought maybe this could be a biomarker for colon cancer patients. So we looked in colon cancer, and you can see it's highly expressed in colon cancer. On the protein level, the only tissue that expresses uh, that you can see high expression of, of, of SAP-2 was colon cancer. So here we did, and you can look at the high full blown uh, resolution also for cancers of course, but here we then extended the study and did a clinical study including over 2,500 patients and actually could establish that this is a good cancer biomarker for, for colorectal cancer. In today's lecture, you have learnt about HPA and found that human proteome atlas could be divided into tissue atlas, cell atlas and pathology atlas. Dr. Pontin demonstrated expression level of different genes in 37 different types of tissue and how this information is important to understand diseases and identify candidate biomarkers. He also talked to us about how the protein atlas can provide you the status of RNA and protein expression in different cancer with patient follow up data. I will highly recommend you to visit HPA website and explore it for you. It will definitely be helpful resource for your own research. In the next lecture, Dr. Pontin will talk about the cell atlas and pathology atlas in more detail. Thank you.